The title of this video is called How States and Companies Shape Transport because it captures the more fundamental force behind different choices of transportation in different countries. In 2021, the Chinese rail loses 300 million RMB per day running their high-speed rail. Surely it is not money that enticed Chinese rail, a state-owned enterprise, to build more high-speed rails. It is the political and economic agents behind those state-owned enterprises with a strong socialist undertone that encourage these projects. <music> In order to explore the factors around this subject though, we need to understand more about high-speed rail. Or rather, I need to make my case for high-speed rail in the first place because it is probably not clear to everyone that the railway is better at all. In fact, to many of you, the railway may be synonymous to a rundown system with low quality of services and convenience, particularly if you live in the United States. But I'm still gonna make my case. Basically, high-speed rail is better. People in different countries experience railways differently. Not everyone gets to enjoy high-speed rails. While my EU audiences may be familiar with Eurostar high-speed rail services that span all across Europe through France, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany, my American and Indian audiences might not know the benefit of that because there is no high-speed rail in India or in the United States, while the mileage of high-speed rail in China is already over 38,000 kilometers in 2021, Japan has more than 3,000 kilometers of high-speed rail in comparison. Each country has its own definition of what high-speed rail is. In the above overview, I use the European definition, which defines high-speed rail to be above 250 kilometers per hour in speed. That's why there's no high-speed rail in the United States. The U.S. has a lower bar at 150 kilometers per hour speed for uh, domestic high-speed rails. So is high-speed rail a superior mode of transportation at all? It seems so at least for travels between 200 kilometers to 1,000 kilometers distance category. Let me explain. Here is McKinsey's list of key reasons to choose the mode of transportation ranked by its level of importance to consumers in 2021. As you can see, for both private and business trips, time to destination and fare are consistently ranked the top reason for choosing the mode of transportation. And high-speed rail is better for both reasons based on empirical data gathered. When it comes to time to destination, the chart here makes a great representation of the competitive edge of high-speed rail. The horizontal axis is the distance to the destination, and the vertical axis is the time needed to complete the trip. High-speed rail saves passenger hours in the 200 kilometers to the 1,000 kilometers distance interval. Passenger air travel and high-speed rail lines intersect at around 1,000 kilometers, after which air travel becomes more convenient and time-saving. This does not take into consideration the cost factor, though. With a speed of 350 kilometers per hour for the Chinese Gaotie, um, its name for high-speed rail, a typical trip from Beijing to Shanghai by Gaotie takes four and a half hour to complete, and the cost is around $80. Trips through air travel from Beijing to Shanghai, on the other hand, is faster at two hours, 15 minutes, and the cost is upward of $150. But if you take into consideration luggage check-in and waiting for it at your destination, the real difference between the two modes of transportation between Shanghai and Beijing is about 30 minutes. Further considering the much better connectivity between high-speed rail and local subway station, the real travel time is about the same as shown in the chart here, not to mention the possibility of maglab in the future, which will double the current speed for high-speed rail. The distance between Beijing and Shanghai is around 1,200 kilometers, so it's on the far end of the examples. For shorter distances travel, such as within England or from London to Paris, which is around 400 kilometers, high-speed rail should save you around one hour travel time compared with air travel. The price of high-speed rail is also consistently lower, often half the price of a typical flight from the same destination. Therefore, high-speed rail is a better alternative to air travel in terms of travel time and fare, at least in China. Another research on intermodal competition 
in the London-Paris passenger market, high-speed rail and air travel point towards a similar conclusion for Europe as well. Though in Europe, the cost factor is almost similar between high-speed rail and air travel. Now we come to a very important factor for high-speed rail, which is that it is environmentally friendly. This is a seldomly talked about benefit of high-speed rail. Since high-speed rail is powered by electricity, it is the most environmentally friendly mode of transportation out there because of three reasons. Number one, automobile engines are much less efficient because they are small and they only carry a few passengers. Aircraft carries more people per vehicle, but its engines produces more pollutants because of the engine design and the need for speed. High-speed rail is the best of both worlds. And number three, high-speed rail has a higher passenger capacity with the Beijing to Shanghai route taking 1,000 passengers per trip, while a typical 737 and an A320 only carries from 150 to 200 passengers per trip. Therefore, high-speed rail produces much lower per capita pollution. So basically, for any trip below 1,000 kilometers in distance, high-speed rail is superior in almost every sense for consumers. I discussed the time to destination and fare factors here, but in fact, if you look back at other factors that affect people's decisions on transport modes such as convenience and space and privacy, high-speed rail is consistently better. Plus, a thousand kilometers is also the majority of air trips in Europe. More than 60% of all air trips taken in Europe are within a thousand kilometers in distance. In addition, I would argue that even though high-speed rail loses its competitive edge when it comes to time to destination between a thousand kilometers to a thousand five hundred kilometers, it is still more convenient with more lag rooms for passengers, not to mention the straightforward environmental benefits. So even a higher percentage, around 75 to 80 percent of air travel trips should be replaced by high-speed rail in an ideal world. Of course, of course, one could develop a subjective preference for air travel or consumer automobile. What I'm saying here is, based on top reasons of choosing the mode of transportation, namely time to destination, price of trip, space and privacy, convenience to avoid congestion as well as sustainability, high-speed rail wins every time. So if high-speed rail really is better for short to medium distance trips below 1,500 kilometers, why is it adopted in some parts of the world and not others? The reasons are really complicated, but we can boil it down to three factors, power, population, and money. Depending on where you are, the world could be classified in three geographies when it comes to high-speed rail adoption. China, Europe and Japan, and the US. China's situation is the most straightforward. The most prominent catalyst for the development of high-speed rail in China is curiously something that's done in Mao's era. On the 30th June 1950, right after the Chinese Communist Party take over from Kuomintang, it is the Chinese land reform and collectivization. It's called land reform, but basically what happened was that land was confiscated from the former landlords and redistributed to landless peasants and owners of small plots. The state becomes the ultimate owner of all lands in China, and because of that, infrastructure building in China is much easier than in most parts of the world. If the CPC has decided to build another high-speed rail from Shanghai to Beijing, the land is theirs to do so. Chinese official statistics have shown that China now has 38,000 kilometers in high-speed rail, 147,000 kilometers railway, and every year 3.3 billion people take the train to their destinations in China. Huge demand, land reform, and the advanced engineering capability is China's secret to becoming the world's number one high-speed rail nation. But what's more important, of course, was the fact that private market powers do not rank supreme in China. Market plays a big role in shaping China's current economic landscape, but they have always been subordinate to the CPC's control. As I've explained earlier, China Rail loses 300 million RMB per day running high-speed rail in China. They run it anyways at a subsidized rate because the head of China Railway was directly appointed by the Chinese State Council and his Communist Party membership is essential to his promotion in the future. I explained this in my previous issue on Chinese space endeavor. Those power dynamics indirectly enabled high-speed rail in this process. Now let's move on to Japan. The case for high-speed rail in Japan is different, especially if you look at the railway's dominance. 
How does Japan enjoy such a high percentage of passenger railway usage, though? Well, the answer is actually quite intuitive. It is population density. The denser an area is in terms of per square kilometer population, the more reliant people are on public transportation. This includes buses, railways, and high-speed rail. When you have 14 million people. In the small area of Tokyo, you need public transportation to make sure the city functions as intended. Similar arguments can be made for Europe as well. Both Europe and Japan traditionally had powerful governments to direct resources and enforce compromises among interests, which is an important enabler for railway projects. And finally, let's talk about the case of the United States. Americans almost have. A romantic sentiment towards automobiles, but is it really that the Americans just love cars? I think not. Before the Second World War, America was the world leader in railway infrastructure, but railways in the United States slowly deteriorated over the years. One of the direct causes of this deterioration is the Federal Eight Highway Act of 1956, enacted by President. Eisenhower, who spent 25 billion for the construction of 41,000 miles, which is 66,000 kilometers of interstate highway system. There were also wide-ranging anti-railway campaigns funded by the auto and the oil industry, which led to the collapse of the passenger railway system in the United States, with only Amtrak surviving. The situation in the United States right now was also due to the way American cities were planned. Americans are used to living in satellite communities where they are far from shopping centers, hospitals, and schools, and they must drive to those places. But for the entirety of my life, for example, in Asia, schools, clinics, and shopping centers are within walking distances almost every time. Therefore, various auto campaigns and policies favoring building a highway in the past, oil, aviation, and auto lobbyists now, and America's lack of commitment to infrastructure building. For the future, becomes the major hindrance of the high-speed rail projects in the United States. In the developed world, this is almost an exclusive problem for the United States and Australia. Probably, the vast landmass with a much less dense population also hindered high-speed rail's prospect in the United States. If the prevalence of high-speed rail in China is due to its state power's push for railway systems, the United States auto industry lobbyist reigns supreme, coupled with population density. All of these shaped how high-speed rail were and are treated in each country today.